Why, hello there. Hey. Hi. 안녕하세요. Today, we are going to be talking about one of my favorite spooky places. So what really drew me into this place was not only was it considered, you know, an asylum, a sanatorium, a dark place full of demented things, but it was the history, the architecture, what went on, the stories, pretty much everything about this place you could ever want. And with that, I bring you to the darkest, the scariest, one of the haunted places. Welcome to Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. So this is Trans Allegheny. Isn't it very lovely? Built to house just 250 patients, each able to have their own room, Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum was constructed between the years of 1858 through 1881. Fun fact, it was actually the second largest hand-cut stone masonry in the world, and the first here in good old America. Its peak was in the 1950s. The patient numbers were around 2,400. Remember, it should have only housed 250. At the end of its construction in 1881, mental health diagnoses hit a spike, this causing overcrowding and conditions to rapidly decrease. So let's put this into perspective for you guys. On the grounds, Trans Allegheny had the main facility, a farm, a dairy, waterworks, a gas well, and a cemetery, as well as a few extra buildings thrown in there for housing. Now, the farm only sustained about 300 people. Doing the math, you know, 300 people, the building should have housed 250, instead housed 2,400. So naturally, a lot of people starve. By 1938, that's about 50 years after it opening, the asylum was already over six times its capacity. Now check out the list. This is all the fun little diagnoses that you would be entered or admitted into the asylum for. Remember briefly talking about the conditions of the asylum? How they were decreasing rapidly? I mean, if you forgot it already, it was just like a minute ago. Patients were sleeping on the floor, freezing, they had no heat, and the staff were overworked trying to accommodate all of the patients while the building was rotting away on its own. By this, I mean all of the neglect and, you know, the fact that these staff members had to take care of over the 250 patients that they were supposed to only have in the facility, 2400, Who's, who's going to be able to take care of the facility itself? Another fun fact, and this is actually one that a lot of people hold on to for some reason. There is no explanation as to why this is or how it became or whatever have you. But by the time that the asylum actually shut its doors, it was on 666 acres of land. That was at its peak. Ever since 2007, since the facility has been sold to private owners here and there, it now only has about 300 acres. This leads to the facility being haunted. No correlation, by the way, between the acreage and the facility itself. But it's said that many people have heard screams, cries, and strange noises inside. Probably why they do ghost tours. Others have seen apparitions or odd lights. Many people say most of the activity happens on the fourth floor due to a fire that broke out in the 1930s, thus leaving a lot of patients trapped. Now back to the original story. In 1949, reports by the Charleston Gazette spoke of what was happening on the grounds. They wrote several reports, including the poor conditions of sanitation, insufficient furniture, lighting, heating, or lack thereof, and the majority of the complex while the wing that was lost in the fire was rebuilt into luxury. 
that's right, it was rebuilt and made actually nicer than the wing that they had. They also had two separate wings because segregation was huge at the time, so they had what they considered the white wing and the black wing. Each wing was made with a rooftop outside area because they viewed sunlight and natural air and nature to be a huge cure for mental illnesses. Here's the fun part. Moving on to the 1950s, things were attempting to change, but not really. Trans Allegheny became the home of the West Virginia Lobotomy Project. What's that, you ask? Mr. Walter Freeman, let's give you a brief history and a rundown of who Walter Freeman is. Born in 1895, earned his PhD in neuropathology in 1924, and was the head of his department, okay? Keep all that in mind. Besides his birthday, it's just fun fact. Hey, maybe to keep his age in perspective and you guys can do the math. Lobotomies were first performed in the 1880s, but kind of failed, you know, they, um, due to the lack of knowledge they had back then. But they were performed by the Swiss psychiatrist Gottlieb Burkhardt. So in 1935, a neurologist and physician, Igis Moniz, and his new leucotomy, keep in mind, they weren't considered lobotomies back then, they were leucotomies, but these leucotomies were meant to treat mental illnesses. Thus, he became a mentor and an idol for Freeman and was left to modify and rename the procedure to the lobotomy. By altering this procedure, they stopped taking the corings from the frontal lobes and instead the new procedure severed the connection from the frontal lobes and the thalamus. Freeman lost his license after a patient's death, which apparently he had stopped one of the procedures to take a photograph. A lobotomy pick pretty much went in a little too far and the patient died. So he lost his license. And from there, he hired his partner, James Watts, who was another neurosurgeon. After this duo formed in 1942, they performed over 200 lobotomies together. Ready for the percentages? You know you can't have a Keo video without percentages and some sort of statistics thrown in there, okay? So with all of their workings written down, jotted down in notebooks and what not have you, out of all of their patients, 63% improved after the lobotomies, 24% were left unchanged, just a give or take, could have worked, could have not, and 14% of those patients got worse. After those practices and those 200 procedures, with many more experimentations thrown in the mix, Freeman developed the transorbital lobotomy. This one is very fascinating. The transorbital lobotomy required the ice pick and a mallet. You know, just to uh, not make this very chilling for you guys, <laughs> the ice pick went into the eye socket pretty much like the inner or outer. It was then nicked on with a mallet, and then they took the ice pick and kind of scrambled it about a little bit, you know? And this caused the severed connections to happen between the prefrontal cortex and the frontal lobes, thus leaving a lot of patients pretty much in like a state of veg. But would you believe that for all of that type of procedure, he would only charge $25 per one procedure. And in the lifetime of his career, he performed over 4,000 procedures. And 2,500 of those were using the ice pick method for the transorbital, which again, kind of just tortured the patients, but they used hydrotherapy and electric shock therapy to try to cure these mental illnesses. So after all of these procedures and new findings and medical advancements, by the 1980s, the asylum pretty much reduced its population, sending a lot of these patients home. And because a lot of the treatments could be done at home with their loved ones. And in 1994, Trans Allegheny closed its doors. By 2007, the facility was privately owned and purchased. 
we had the opportunity to run into two very, very nice women there, and they were nice enough to give us a little rundown of everything that pretty much like the facility had. Hello, my name is Andrea and I'll be your tour guide today. I'd like to start by saying you are standing in front of the largest hand cut stone building in the United States. The only thing bigger of its kind is the Kremlin in Moscow. This building is 1,295 feet long. That means it lacks just 25 feet of being a quarter of a mile from that end to that end. It has three and a half acres of roof, nine acres of floor space, 921 windows, and 906 doors. The walls are two and a half foot thick, and they're all faced with brick. The brick was made on the property. They made up to 100,000 bricks a week, and the stone behind it came from the riverbank out front. It took over 20 years to complete the building. Uh, there you Thank go. you. <laughs> and there was one lady that had been here for like 20 years or so. And they told her she had to leave. And she'd worked over town for that 20 years. She'd worked over town. There were little apartments on the fourth floor. She'd come back and stayed in that apartment. So they told her she had to leave. And she got real upset. She went over town, came back, locked herself in her room. And they started to, no, no, she'll be fine. She's not going to do anything to herself. She's just upset. So while they were looking, they found out that this lady had a daughter that was a doctor in California. So they notified her and said, we'll be sending your mother to you. So they took her out to Sheets, put her on a Greyhound bus. And when they were packing her clothes up and getting her ready, there's this little lady had an old brown, nasty looking jacket. And they said, well, you know, you don't want to wear that. And she said, and she just insisted, I'm wearing this coat, my coat, and we'll wear it. So they took her out to Sheets and put her on the bus. And she rode that three days out to California. And no longer than it took for her to get there, they got a phone call back from the daughter that was the doctor in California. She said, what kind of people are you? You put my mother on a bus for three days. You didn't give her anything, make sure she had money to eat. You didn't make sure she could had anything place to stay and you put that dirty brown coat on her what kind of people are you so whoever helped the mother in the release said why don't you go check your mother's coat so the daughter went in and she checked the pockets and she checked the hem she felt something in the hem and she ripped it open and there she found twenty thousand dollars that the little lady had saved while she worked oh stayed free God. for here and wow. worked over town and she may have been insane but she was not stupid so that in that old nasty coat nobody wanted to mess with somebody wearing an old nasty no. brown coat and wow. uh, had money when she got there so there you go somebody said how could that be if you only made a thousand dollars a year and you saved it all and you lived here had nobody to spend it on nothing to spend it on Somebody said, well, why didn't her daughter know? Well, a lot of times you would just put in, you know, because her mind wasn't any good. Her daughter probably didn't know where she was. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, there's your little story to go home with. Cool. Oh, not well, thank you. Was mean and not everybody here was the only issue with this being that we were not able to get any footage of the inside of the facility because, you know, your girl is not trying to get caught. But they do offer tours Tuesday through Saturday, and they also offer overnight tours. Now, they do have like three different levels that you could do, which is like, you know, a basic tour, an intermediate tour that goes over like the entire facility, and then like the overnight tour where you can spend the night inside of the place, which I think happens more around Halloween time. Yeah, no, they're, they're renovations of the project, which you can actually go onto their website and donate to help restore this historical landmark. But they're doing a phenomenal job on the restoring aspect of history. With that being said, if you guys have any questions or comments, concerns, little added bonuses that you would like to throw into the mix, definitely write those down in the comment section. And if you liked what you saw in the video, then definitely give it a big ol' thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because I do have a few more of these types of videos coming. I love spooky history. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye guys.